Okay, I, I think most people know me. I'm Rex Chisholm from Northwestern, and it's my pleasure to moderate this final panel discussion. Although we've had an enormous amount of discussion already today, I'm sure the, the panel is uniquely qualified to uh, take us in some new directions. Just to let you know what we have planned for you, each of the panelists is gonna make some comments for about three to four minutes, uh, just to set their perspective on this question of uh, what are the gaps in terms of research implementation, and I guess maybe we can even broaden that a little bit, although I know they've all thought about this in detail. Uh, not just research implementation, but I think also uh, thinking about quality improvement implementation, because we've heard a lot of discussion today about whether this should be done as a research implementation or quality improvement implementation, and you know, that might even be something that we should focus a little bit on. Um, and then I'll ask each of them just to reintroduce themselves to you as they speak. Um, and then after that, each of them has made their comments. Um, we'll start to have a little bit of discussion driven by their comments and very quickly open the floor to participation, not just for questions, but also for comments from uh, people in the rest of the audience. So, uh, Dick, I'll ask you to go first. Uh, first of all, let me say, that I found the whole day really invigorating uh, because uh, all of us are dealing with the same issues and we're approaching it in slightly different ways and I think that's all to the good. Uh, before I talk about where things might be going, I might mention the sort of um, uh, setting within which uh, what I'm going to say comes from. Number one, and somebody should say this very clearly, Anything that we've done at the Mayo Clinic has been entirely because of the foundation laid by NIH funding through the eMERGE grant, which we've had for years, and the, uh, the PGRN grant. So the NIH has laid the foundation for what I'm going to say, and I feel, feel obliged to say that very clearly. What we're now moving to do is to build on that foundation, and really the use of the PGRN Seek version one for 1,000 patients from our biobank to sequence that information and put it preemptively in the electronic health record was a pilot study for what we are now doing because that taught us a lot and we're now moving forward with 10,000 patients from our biobank in collaboration with Baylor uh, for $300, that's the cost, with the regulatory cost of CLIA, about half of it's regulatory, about half is sequencing for 77 pharmacogene sequence based. Because as we look to the future, number one, uh, I heard the discussion about panels versus not panels. All we are putting in the electronic health record are those variants that are part of the uh, 19 drug gene pair alerts we currently have. But we've got all the other genes that are, are put aside and they were done in a CLIA environment. Uh, they are all the transporters, all the drug metabolizing enzymes, phase one, phase two, all the things you would think about. So against that background, then, how are we proceeding to use that information? Because our electronic health record goes back 20 years, we're immediately able to do retrospective studies, and we're doing that. Number two, we're doing prospective studies, and we're going to do that. And the approach that we have taken is to ask each of the clinical departments and divisions involved, and if all you have to do is take $300 times 10,000, and you know what the institution paid in order to develop the data. So we are asking people to write protocols for data access, and we're putting the focus on the clinical departments and divisions. Now, why are we doing that? Because what we see really happening is that it's a young faculty member with a fellow or two within each department who knows their drugs and their practice, and they've taken ownership. Now, immediately we have a, a champion in that division and department. The other thing that I haven't heard here, which surprised me, but which we're, we're now learning, they do know their practice better than anyone. And the one thing, Terry, I haven't heard here is that what I'm surprised to find is the procedures within the hospital in the academic medical center can be changed by the kind of information they're developing. And I heard, yeah, uh, Vanderbilt made a whole lot of money on those multiple stents uh, because that was clinical income. I, I heard that comment made. So what we're talking about now is actually making our processes 
that are drug related within the hospital. I can give you a concrete example of someone in the question wants to, question and answer wants to ask about it. And I was surprised to, to see that kind of efficiency coming forward out of having these data. So what, what you're hearing is one model in which number one at the top of our list are the economic analyses and that's why Dr. Wilson is here because uh, clearly we went to him for advice and, and guidance to think about how to do that. Clearly we need to be thinking about now what are we doing because I think this is something I hadn't thought through. The doctors didn't order this test. Up until now, all of our drug gene pair alerts were when a doctor wrote a prescription. We're now gonna take 10,000 local patients who get all of their care at the Mayo Clinic. The doctor didn't order the test, and now that information is gonna be there. These are mainly in our primary care clinics, so there'll be hundreds of these patients for any one doctor, for some doctors. The implications of having information suddenly appear that has clinical implications, we already are thinking through that from an ethical and a legal point of view and are making certain that we don't find ourselves with a patient suddenly having an alert firing. The alerts only fire when you write the prescription. Having information that says what your doctor ordered for you is not good for you. Think through the, doing that with 10,000 patients. And we now have 4,000 of the samples are already being sequenced. By the uh, early fall, all 10,000 of those data will be back. There are some significant legal and ethical issues that we're going to find ourselves facing. Uh, and clearly, we haven't even talked about cancer uh, and psychiatry, which the people at, uh, at NHGRI know that I have some interest in, uh, where we have no biological markers. Those are all things that I'd hope we will talk about before we're done. And hopefully I didn't make Rex too mad and did I go over, over my, a little. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. Uh, Stephen. So I too will um, place my comments into uh, context. Um, I lead a p pediatric clinical pharmacology uh, group in a uh, pediatric hospital and our um, institution largely supports um, our activities beyond what uh, uh, we can bring in in grants. And the reason it does so is that uh, uh, there's not all that information on um, uh, genotype guided dosing in children because there's not very much information on dosing of medications in children that has been generated in children, so therefore it's difficult to know how much to reduce the dose. So part of our role is to generate the uh, information that's going to be needed before we can do any implementation. And the other part of our responsibility is to educate the uh, uh, pediatric subspecialists who are going to take ownership in um, implementing this in their particular areas. So I've got three um, pediatric related knowledge gaps and, and sort of three general ones. In terms of pediatric, again, the first thing is um, uh, we have to generate the knowledge base uh, related to genotype uh, guided drug dosing information for uh, kids and preferably in the population that's going to be treated with the medications. One of the things that we have learned is that there is no substitute to generating this information in kids. There are real limitations to trying to extrapolate adult experience in kids. And I'll give an example of this with simvastatin um, tomorrow. And another important thing that uh, we need to think about is uh, engaging the uh, families, the patients and their parents. Um, because this is a, uh, a two or three way uh, process. The idea is to implement um, uh, precision therapeutics into, uh, into the patient care, and you really can't do that if it's just a one-way street. And so we uh, developing the tools that help to explain to um, patients and their families what we're talking about when we're talking about pharmacogenetics uh, is an important uh, knowledge uh, gap that needs to be addressed. Uh, in general, uh, I think it's important for us to remember that designing a study to look at uh, CYP2D6 pharmacogenetics and the response to a, uh, an antidepressant uh, misses the point that the proximal phenotype for CYP2D6 is not drug response, it's actually drug exposure. And so we need to uh, um, start thinking about how we're actually going to integrate pharmacogenomics at the level of the drug target into, uh, into some of these uh, uh, studies and, and uh, into clinical care. Dick kind of addressed the, my next point, and that is, is genotyping for one or two common variants um, really uh, 
good enough. And, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, work coming out now. Um, uh, Mary and St. Jude's uh, methotrexate and, and the burden of uh, rare variants in SLC01B1, for example. Uh, I think we've got to look beyond common variants. And then finally, uh, this is just something that we face on a daily basis, are, is the, uh, the genotyping results that are coming back to the direct-to-consumer. Genotyping companies and the lack of um, uh, data, uh, prospective validation of some of those uh, of genetic markers, but particularly with respect to uh, drug response. And if you do a two-by-two two table from uh, GWAS data, because there will be some people who respond that uh, have the uh, wild type and, and the, refer the reference and the, uh, the variant uh, genotype, there will be some non-responders that do. When you do a two-by-two two table, sometimes the specificity and the sensitivity don't add up to uh, um, a clinically useful test. So that's a prospective validation is the, is the last thing we need to do. Last point I'm going to make. Hi, I'm Micheline Piquette, and I'm from the University of Toronto, uh, which is in Canada. Uh, <laughs> just in case someone might not know. Is that yeah. why you talk funny? <laughs> That's why I talk funny, exactly. Um, and there isn't as many implementation studies uh, in Canada as there are in the United States, partially because of the funding. Um, it's a much smaller country, a lot less money for funding. Um, but one of the things is that I see, my, our vision, me and a, a number of the people at the faculty see um, the pharmacogenetics being implemented in a real life situation. Everyone ha know, has their pharmacogenetic test results done. And so in that case, we wanted to see, we, there's very, the research gap is that there's not really a, that many uh, research studies that have actually tested um, the pharmacogenetic feasibility of services in a real life situation. So um, one of our questions was that which healthcare provider is best positioned mm -hmm. to provide pharmacogenetic mm -hmm. services in primary care. And this is both logistically as well as economically. And so in our, in our study we did, we were looking at putting, positioning pharmacists pharmacists as the front line person for providing pharmacogenetic services. They see all the prescriptions. They often have relationships with their patients. And many of them in the small community pharmacies have very good relationships with their physicians as well too. So the pharmacists, if we educate them, they can educate the community. So we see the pharmacists as providing the education to the patients and providing the, the education as well to the physicians. Uh, so we developed some uh, training programs in order to try and address that and also um, I was working on a um, continuing edu education program for that's online that's available to all pharmacists in Ontario free of charge so they can do their pharmacogenetics. Um, I also teach um, in third year pharmacy students, I teach them a course on personalized medicine and I tell them you guys have to get ready to do this because you will be doing this in your lifetime. Um, but a couple of things that um, when trying to determine, get the payers to agree to cover the costs of, of pharmacogenetic services is that they want to know the cost effectiveness. Um, so we've talked about this a lot and especially what's, what's lacking is the cost effectiveness of preemptive testing across a panel of common gene variants. And so, you know, you see the, the single drug, single gene, that's been, there's cost effectiveness studies there. And, but when we ask for a panel, we, we, we can't really, we haven't got the data behind us to, to tell them, you know, how, they, how this will help them. And especially in Canada, we have a separate, we have a universal healthcare system. The government pays for our hospitalizations and for our doctor's visits, uh, but all of us have private insurance policies for our drug. So drugs and hospitalizations and physician visits are separated, so. Um, and so the other thing, the last thing I think is also um, in case of this is that what's the best outcomes to measure, particularly in community settings where the patients may be relatively healthy. So we can't, you know, deaths and heart attacks may be too, too pronounced. We may have more subtle differences in improved patient care. And so do we do measure the number of prescriptions, number of physician visits? It was, those are the types of things we are tackling with and how to design proper implementation studies. Thank you. Well, good afternoon again. I'm John Wilson. Um, for, for the folks that don't know me, know me, once again, I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer at a company called Optum. Um, and to be clear, uh, Optum is one half of United Health Group, 
The other half of United Health Group is United Health Care. So if you think about United Health Group as two platforms, Optum is one platform, United Health Care is the other platform. Most folks here, when you talk about payers, you're really referring to United Health Care. To be clear, I don't work for United Health Care. I work for, for Optum. And we do a lot of work with our, our payer um, siblings, if you will. Um, let me paint you a picture about Optum, because it will help contextualize some of my comments and questions in this space. So Optum is a healthcare services company. To give you an indication of the size and scale, we employ about 140,000 people. And we will, last year our revenues were out of United Health Group. United Health Group's total revenues were about $185 billion. About $100 billion was from United Health Care. And approximately, again these numbers are approximate, $85 billion or so was from, from Optum. Optum has a number of divisions. Uh, we have an analytics division. Uh, which provides products and services to other payers, to providers, um, to life sciences companies. Um, we have a, um, a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager. We are the third largest PBM in the United States. Directly or indirectly, we'll touch 63 million people through that group, processing close to a billion scripts. So when we think about pharmacogenomics, that's obviously an interesting area. And then finally, we provide services directly to consumers. We are, have and do have about 20,000 affiliated physicians that work with us and for us. So why do I share that with you? Because when we think about this domain, we think about it from multiple different levels. We don't just think about it from the payer perspective. We think about it from the provider's perspective as well as the consumer perspective. Let me just hit on, I'm getting flagged for, for, for speeding up. Let me, let me hit on some of the key issues. Um, and you've heard me talk about these earlier through the course of the day. The first thing, and I cannot stress this to you enough, we have to get the coding right. I don't mean, it's unfortunate with my accent, when you say coding, I don't mean codeine the drug. Um, I mean coding... Just, just call it warfarin and it'll be easier for us all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the codes. Um, and let me be clear what, what I mean by that. Um, and I, I'll share some perspective. One perspective is that CPT codes in this domain will never be sufficient to meet the needs of it. So let me tell you what I, what, I, what I mean by that to push on it one step further. There needs to be a net new coding system, right? CPT codes may not cut this because the rate of change of pace in this space is far, far, far faster than it takes to get a CPT code. And so part of that, part of this community is if we can work together with you folks, to explore some different domains. Oh, no, maybe I'm getting an alarm. If we can work together with you folks to find new ways to code for this, that will help in two fundamental important areas. One's around reimbursement. I cannot stress that enough. The second is around quality. So a lot of people have interpreted my comments as saying, well, you know, if we can get the codes right, we can figure out how to pay for them. That's definitely, there's truth to that. The other part I'd stress to you is that if we can get accurate data by understanding exactly what test has been done, we can link that up to all of our other data assets. And let me just digress for, how long have I got, 30 seconds? What I mean by that, we sit on about, 100 and, about 180 million lives worth of claims data. Uh, we pull close to a million charts a year. Um, we have access and we extract from about 80 million EMRs. We have a lot of data assets. Um, we're PBM. We know a lot about what gets prescribed, where and when. The ability to link those data sets together with an understanding and appreciation about what genomic test has been done is clearly valuable to this space. I think it could help a lot of the questions that are being answered. However, in order to do that, we need to make sure we exactly know what test was ordered. And right now, in my opinion, the CPT codes don't support that. And plus to, I think it's Mark, is it Mark? Mark's comments earlier. I, one of the things I, I, I may disagree with you about some of your comments, we can have a conversation about that later, and I think that's healthy. But one area where I do agree with you on is it is important whoever's making a decision about CPT goes actually be equipped to make that decision. Um, and I'm curious, I don't know enough about the mechanics of the AMA, about how many geneticists they've actually got on staff when they make these decisions. So. <laughs> There, there is a point around coding, and I cannot, again, I'll stress it enough, if there's five things I could ask you to do, the first three would be, let's help figure out the coding, the second one would be, let's help figure out the coding, and the third one would be, let's help figure out the coding. That will reduce a lot of the tension and friction in this space. 
I'm probably over time. I'm going to hit you with two other comments. <laughs> Go ahead. Quality. I cannot, again, stress that to you enough. It's a real worry right now when you see the variety of quality in the space. Um, like any new technology, there's variance, and that's, that's understandable. But the ability to measure that variance, understand that variance, and try and drive to a... Um, to an improvement in that space, I think it's going to be fundamental. We do worry about this variation. Um, not everybody can be the best interpreter. Um, we need to have better methods to understand that. Um, and again, we would be uh, actively seeking uh, folks to engage with us to help figure out what does quality look like. So if any of you all are interested in that, please grab me later. And the final point is obviously the data and the health economics. There is a sparsity of data in this space. I think that's a common consensus. There needs to be better um, quality of health economic studies here to help any payer, regardless of whether they're an individual insurer or a large payer like CMS, or one of the delegated providers, or a large employer group, understanding exactly what the benefits are going to be. So to summarize, coding, quality, health economics. So I'm Julie Johnson, um, and I think there are lots of gaps, but I'm going to pick one. Um, and my argument is that our most important gap remains an evidence gap. And we talk a lot in pharmacogenetics about frustrations, about uh, genetic exceptionalism, pharmacogenetic exceptionalism, look at renal function. Um, at drug interactions as examples. Um, and the reality is those things are often um, inferred now through simulations, not through actual clinical studies. But the reality is 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were lots of clinical studies, not necessarily randomized controlled trials, but clinical studies that documented in human studies drug interactions and documented the impact of renal function on drug dosing and, and things like that. So I, I think that we um, are not quite there for most of our drug gene examples in terms of the evidence. We have a few where we are. Um, I think we've been there for a long time with it. Um, thiopurines, I think with the data Larry will show tomorrow with clopidogrel. I mean, so I think they're coming, but we have to continue to build the evidence, hopefully, eventually, we will get to the point, at least for the um, pharmacokinetic-related uh, pharmacogenetic examples, that, you know, how many times do our predictions have to be right? So if we're right, you know, 20 out of 20, and pretty much all of our examples so far, you know, they, they line up with what the clinical pharmacologist would predict. And hopefully, eventually, we will become like drug interactions and renal function, where you don't have to do a lot of studies. You just have to have that background evidence of the relationship between genotype and, in this case, pharmacogenetics. I think drug targets are going to be harder. Um, so I think that in the absence of evidence, we're, we're going to have a hard time convincing payers, we're going to have a hard time convincing clinicians, and, um, and, and I think it sort of underpins many of the challenges. There are many, but that's, that's to me the most important one. You showed a lot of restraint. Um, so it's been great to hear that everybody loves CPIC guidelines for facilitating implementation. So I guess the first gap I would just like to point out is that we are not done with CPIC guidelines. <laughs> um, there's still some that need to be written, and what we've learned is that they take constant care and feeding. So if, even if we reach some steady state of 20 to 30 guidelines, uh, we don't see this as something that's just going to end. Um, at, at least in the foreseeable future, as there's more and more genetic variants being discovered, I think that we're going to be in a, pl a period of 5, 10, 15 years where there's a lot of evidence just relating to genomic variation and phenotypic variation that we're going to need to keep um, tracking. And locally, in our own implementation program, you know, we're behind in implementing even those CPIC genes that already have guidelines because um, of the work that's involved in actually putting this together. So I still think that building infrastructure, um, tables that can be imported into sophisticated EHRs, uh, clinical decision support that gives real prescribing information based on genetic variation. I still think we're in a period of a few years where we have to work this out 
in sophisticated tertiary care settings. I'm all for moving this into the community and community pharmacies as soon as we can, but I think it's gonna be very difficult to do that well until we've proven that we can do that well in um, tertiary care settings. Um, one thing I heard from today is that uh, there are probably opportunities to aggregate outliers with very rare drug-induced phenotypes, um, such as we heard about this morning, the Stevens-Johnson syndrome type um, reactions that are just incredibly rare. Now with the, the web, there's ways that we should be able to share information about that, and maybe this community should do better at creating a single system for putting together these rare outlying patients rather than having a hundred different databases um, to, to share information about them and, and generate evidence about what might be behind their unusual um, uh, outlying response reactions. I also think that we should come up with metrics of benefit that can be accepted that don't necessarily involve cost because we've all got plenty of examples where we think that patients really benefit and as we heard about from Dan's talk, it's gonna be very difficult to demonstrate cost effectiveness when it's by definition a small percentage of the population that's gonna benefit from most of these things. So research on establishing other metrics of benefit would be good. I still think we need to come up with standardized terms for test results to be used in the EHR so we can um, share information and that that will contribute to making these tests that are lifelong tests, tests that can be used by patients long term. So I also think we should look into methods for um, providing genetic information on a per patient basis where they have it in some kind of a chip or a card or a smartphone um, symbol or something so that um, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, patients can move from pharmacy to pharmacy and from provider to provider with an assessment of their genetics that could be read for the foreseeable um, future. So I think there's people already doing that, that we can copy, uh, like our friends in Europe, and apparently their cards are made here. Um, so I guess those are a few of the gaps that I see that we could address. Okay, thanks. I that, that gives us a wide range of things to talk about. So maybe to structure it, what I'd like to do is I put it into a few categories, and then maybe we can open the floor for discussion in those categories. So the, the first category that several of you referred to that I think it would be good to tackle is the category of uh, evidence gaps. So I think we've heard about a few examples of evidence gaps. We've heard about maybe problems in study design. So maybe we need to think about study design I think we heard about what the endpoints are. Are they outcomes? Are they uh, a, a lowered uh, serum measurement? Are there, um, and then sort of a third kind of gap that a couple of you alluded to, but we haven't talked explicitly about, which I think would be very interesting to talk about is, uh, how many CPIC guidelines do we need ultimately? And how many other genes are there out there that we don't know about that we need to be talking about? So. Let's just open the floor up for discussion about how do we make sure we get uh, to some resolution on evidence gaps in terms of whether people actually believe the data is significant, and then what's the scale of the problem? How many things are there out there that we don't know about? I'm going to sound like Dick Cheney pretty soon, but yes. so yeah, no, no, no. yeah, we'd like to start with that evidence gaps. How do we fix them? So, I mean, so I, I think that we have to pick the low-hanging fruit. I mean, we've, we've sort of done that. I think, um, you know, the work that um, has been done at St. Jude with the thiopurines, um, you know, starting a couple decades ago is, is one example of that low-hanging fruit. I think clopidogrel was low-hanging fruit. Warfarin was low-hanging fruit. It just, you know, had some challenges, I think, because um, of study design. So, I mean, I, I think we have to think about, you know, do we continue to sort of focus on this one drug at a time approach or one class of drugs at a time approach, um, or think about a model like is being done in Europe, which has sort of 
in the US, it would probably be the CPIC level drugs and sort of tackle all of those because people aren't, you know, sort of one drug in their lifetime kind of people. And, um, and then if you do that though, then the, then the important outcome may differ. So how do you define what the outcome is? You know, what is the important outcome? I mean, if you're looking at a PPI, the important outcome is different than if you're looking at clopidogrel or warfarin. Um, and so figuring out how you would sort of collect all of those together. Um, and, and, the, and the group in Europe has done that. I think those that have, have looked closely at that may not think about it in exactly the same way, but I mean, I think they have given us a roadmap um, of, of where you might start. And I mean, I think my sense is there's sort of universal agreement that, you know, a gene or one drug and the genes that go with it at a time isn't the logical approach. Um, so, so I think, you know, the challenge is how do we sort of cover the evidence gap that builds evidence for a lot of different drugs, but does it with a preemptive panel and sort of does a, a collective approach? Mary? And I guess I'm distinguishing between discovery research and implementation. And I think that one drug at a time and however many genes it takes is the way to go when we're trying to generate evidence. Um, when, when we take real life populations that are having all their messiness and all their concurrent drugs and they're altering disease status, that generates more noise than the increased sample size that you get will allow you to make discoveries. Even for thiopurines in the setting of childhood ALL, one can't find an association between TPMT genotypes and myelosuppression depending on the therapy. So the more extra drugs you put in, the more real life confounders that you add in studies like the UPGX study, the less likely you are to discover gene phenotype associations. When we come to implementation, yeah, I'm all for test every possible gene and implement for every possible drug. But if you're still not convinced that there's an association between CYP2D6 status and tricyclic pharmacokinetics, you're not going to discover it by studying 8,000 patients with all their messiness. Yeah, so I think we're probably talking about two different kinds of evidence. So, so the evidence gap that I'm really talking about not, not to dismiss discovery, but in, in, this, in the context of this meeting, I'm really talking about the evidence that genotype-guided approach is beneficial clinically. It, it won't work when there's that much noise. Yeah, well, one, one of the things is that um, if it's pharmacokinetic-based drug-gene interaction, that would be just blood levels that we need. And you need very, very small sample size to determine whether or not the blood levels are altered. And that's what the case that happened with the, in renal disease is that they use a very small number of patients with renal failure and they measure the blood levels and they determine, yes, the blood levels are higher, so therefore they need a lower dose. Same thing with drug-drug interactions, is that they just monitor the blood levels. Very small sample size as opposed to outcomes. So it's... I, I right, but a lot of clinicians don't gravitate to drug levels. Mark? So I would propose a way forward that reconciles those, those two issues because they're both important. Mary is absolutely correct that in terms of uh, trying to develop uh, the evidence, it needs to be developed in a relatively uh, constrained way. But the other point uh, that's relevant to evidence is that not all elephant, elephant, elephant. <laughs> <laughs> evidence gaps are elephantine in size. No, um, elephant evidence gaps are the same. And that's where I think the role of modeling is really important. We've talked a little bit about economics here, and one of the tools of economics is to do modeling. And the advantage of modeling, um, first of all, is that you don't need any data, um, so that's useful. Um, but uh, the point is, is that by using assumptions around different uh, decision points in the model, you can decide, well, you know, we can vary this node a tremendous amount, and it makes no difference at the end of the day. So we shouldn't be expending resources to try and get that piece of evidence, whereas this piece of evidence, if, that, if we're off by 10 percent there, the model goes from being cost effective to, you know, and so we really need to focus there. So focusing limited resources on closing the correct evidence gaps is really important. And then the other approach from modeling that I think can reconcile the, the two issues of single versus the multiple is that you can use a threshold approach by which you can take uh, uh, situations where we have good evidence uh, of, um, 
uh, of the cost effectiveness uh, of it, like the clopidical example or the uh, Abacavir and HLA uh, B and, and a few others. And you can say, well, if we add these up and given a test cost for a given panel, at which point do we cross the threshold where essentially every other test we do is not going to, you know, somehow flip us back into not being cost effective, but in fact, will make it more cost effective, accepting the fact that, as Howard pointed out, we still have to deal with the issue of, you know, the unintended consequences generating costs downstream. But I agree with him that I think that that's relatively minimal. But then you get to the point of saying, hey, you know, if we have these three genes and these variants that cover these CPIC variants, at that point, for any patient, we essentially achieve a threshold, an acceptable threshold of cost effectiveness. Therefore, other things we add on there, we don't have to go back through the same argument every single time. Other thoughts about evidence gap? Howard. I think one, one uh, another elephant that was, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, one, one thing that, that John highlighted earlier was a, around uh, category C, uh, or whatever they're called, uh, uh, examples. And, you know, we've been, we, we don't, we haven't put as much emphasis on the, on the drugs who don't need or are unlikely to benefit from the, uh, from pharmacogenomics. The, the things where the, the, the data is weak that was brought up, um, I think shaping that would really be useful because, one, it would highlight um, some of the drugs that have never been tested. If you take the 200 most prescribed drugs, not, not the money on the money list, but the most prescribed volume-wise, there's still almost half of them that you can't find a pharmacogenetic study, even a candidate SNP study, much less candidate gene or GWAS. And, and so it would highlight the areas where there, there is a drug that has variability toxicity, whatever, that needs, needs some work. Um, it, it also would put some to rest. And I think having some no's um, allows people to take the yeses more seriously. And, and right now, we've, we've been, for very practical and, and right reasons, um, focused on, on the yeses. I don't think that, you know, it's going to be hard to get a lot of people excited about being on the no committee for CPIC. But, you know, going and buzzing through that and getting some of those done uh, will, will allow us to then have those types of, of discussions a little bit more clearly because I think there are gaps on the drugs that are used where it was no one's pet drug, it's a generic drug maybe, there's no, um, what used to, there's a term that you used to be able to use um, that you can't, I'm told you I can't use anymore. There's no sugar daddy for those, um, for, for those drugs. I know it has a different meaning now. I've been told that by young people. But it, in, the, in the old use of the word term, there's no one favoring it, trying to help it go through. So there, there's, a, you know, there's a, an opportunity there to really define that for the field um, that, that I think we can make. I, I like the no. I mean, it, it really does help people think that you're not just a true believer if you can actually say no to some things. So I think that's actually an important point. Jeff. So, so one of the lessons uh, from the Ignite uh, network um, that we've discussed is that um, it's probably insufficient for a single site to be able to carry out a pharmacogenetic study with sufficient numbers to generate the evidence required. And I think, you know, at least we've discussed hypothetically, if we had it to do over again, it might be um, a, a series of lar a network that focuses on, on maybe one study or a series of studies, but not each, each of the five or six sites do, doing something on their own, which is what I was trying to get at before, the collective expertise of all the different pharmacogenetic implementers in the room and others that are not in the room could be harnessed to generate the kinds of evidence that are, are necessary. That's what, you know, that's what is done with drugs, right? You know, there are large multi-center, multinational clinical trials because you need the numbers. You need the numbers to generate sufficient evidence. So that's one thing that should be seriously considered, I think. And the second is, um, bar again, borrowing from the playbook of the pharmaceutical industry, registries. You know, registries are really um, huge repositories of clinical outcome data as well as economic data that are often used to, to um, convince payers to, to, um, to make the right coverage decisions. So, you know, we, we have, a, again, we have the, the basis for large pharmacogenetic registries given the centers in the room, how do we pull, somebody said it earlier, you know, how do you pull all this data together in a, in a common repository that makes it usable and longitudinal? Yeah, and just to build on what Jeff is saying, I think to make either of those models work, a multicenter clinical trial, <laughs> building on the <clears throat> Ignite net network, for example, or to think of a registry, um, 
capitalizing the idea of common outcome measures um, and deciding what that would be um, would be really critically important. And I keep hearing these two uses the ver of the term evidence. Um, when I think of implementation research, it's really to promote adoption of an evidence-based intervention. So if we, we as a community would have to decide is um, what we're trying to test evidence-based yet. And um, there's a lot of variation, you know, some, some of the things we're still talking about discovery for, for certain drug gene pairs and other things we have specific guidelines for. So clearly there's a whole continuum in terms of the degree of evidence. So if we're on the end where there's a CIPIC guideline, and I think that's really the focus of today's meeting, then what I've heard the most um, for is really this idea of preemptive testing for a pharmacogenomics panel. And so um, that seems to be where there's the most uh, energy and agreement, that that's where the, the proof of concept needs to go for this type of trial. And so if you would marry that with common outcome measures, it seems to me like that would be sort of taking it to the next level. That's sort of what I've heard. So I, th I think the question of evidence gap is, is an interesting one. And in some ways, uh, it seems to me that um, in some regards, the problem is the enemy is us. That often is the case. Yeah, some of you know, I've told the story before, at, at Northwestern when we tried to implement the, farm, the Emerge PGX project, uh, you know, initially my Pollyanna approach was, oh, we'll implement all the, P, all the CPIC guidelines and for everyone that we, because we were sequencing all the genes, for everyone that there was, we'll, we'll uh, provide that evidence, we'll provide that information back to the participants. We were stymied in that because we couldn't persuade the physicians that we were working with, and so the, the idea of uh, lack of clinician buy-in, I think, fits into this whole question of the evidence gap. You know, how, they they just weren't persuaded that the data is there. So we need to think about designs that actually give us robust evidence that will be persuasive. Now, you're never going to get 100% people to agree because that's just the way the world is. But are there things that we need to be doing to deal with this problem of lack of clinician buy-in? Will just better studies with better data do that? Or do we need to be doing something fundamentally different? I mean, so, that, so I think that's, I mean, what you just said maybe captured my concern about or my point about the evidence gap. I mean, so within the CPIC guidelines, I think there even in the current guidelines, there's really two groups. I mean, there are groups where there's very strong data that, you know, few people would argue that there are different outcomes. I mean, I think there's others where there's good evidence, there's good associations between a phenotype and a genotype, and yet, a, you know, a high percentage of clinicians are not going to be comfortable based on the evidence available. I'll take voriconazole, for example. We just published a paper on voriconazole genotype. Um, and uh, drug concentration relationship um, that showed that uh, in patients with one or two copies of the star 17 allele, they are significantly more likely to have a subtherapeutic trough. 50% of the population that we studied in this sort of prospective but not an active genotype intervention study died. And yet, our clinicians are, you know, they want to do under a research protocol an implementation. And so I think that you, you just, you know, you have to sort of meet clinicians where they are at some level. Now hopefully, you know, if we're 10 years down the road and we have 20 examples, then it's enough that you have the drug concentration and the genotype relationship, but we're not there. And so I think we have to, that your experience is I think exactly the, the challenge that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, there's a group of people who are comfortable with the CPIC recommendations, which I think are, are great, it's just that there's not, you know, the vast majority of clinicians aren't comfortable that the level of evidence is such that they want to actively do something different based on genotype unless it's under a research protocol. So, so it's sort of true clinical intervention they're just not ready for. So I'm not surprised you had that experience because I think for a lot of the things, even under CPIC, um, let alone some of the things that are being recommended with commercial firms, um, there, there's this sense of an evidence gap and we just need a little, just give us a little more to push us over the edge, I think is the general sentiment that we see with clinicians. So Julie, that, that's what I was trying to say at the beginning. First of all, the way we got our 19 gene pair, drug gene pair rules implemented was through a subcommittee of our formulary committee, 
because that was already constituted to have subspecialty expertise which could be consulted with regard to what drugs go in the formulary. And that made it possible for John Black, who was a, as you know, runs our pharmacogenomics lab, but he's also a board certified psychiatrist, to deal with those groups. And he said the major skill set that made it possible to get those drug gene pair rules implemented was his background in psychiatry. I don't know what he was trying to say. But, but, but the point I was making earlier, now that we have across the board, a good deal of information about thousands of our patients. What we've done is gone back and asked the physicians themselves what they want to do to make themselves feel comfortable. Some of them are approaching this as if it was a you know, randomized trial, but others have taken somewhat different approaches and we empower them. Now, did I think at the beginning that this would be as useful as it has been? Frankly, not. But as it turns out, it's extremely useful because with all due respect, if I go to the chair of our division of cardiovascular disease, which is bigger than many departments of medicine, and I'm just a general internist and I suggest something, uh, it will, I'll get a polite response, but that's all. If it's a young faculty member in his division and fellows from his division, then he begins to take ownership. And all I'm saying is that this sounds so simple and straightforward. As a matter of fact, it's turned out to be really important in terms of getting their enthusiasm going. And the anesthesiologists, for example, who have phenotypes that we in medicine, frankly, would salivate for because they keep track of everything. And they're now seeing, oh my goodness, I can use this. So that I think all of us in our own micro environments. Every environment is different. Every, you've seen one academic medical center, you've seen one academic medical center. I think we need to be thinking about how can we move forward to, to learn from our colleagues. And I've, I frankly have found that it's been much more useful than I would have, have thought initially. And we all have the same problem, the one you were just talking about. So we talked a little bit this morning about design and talked about having to do designs where we were really doing a genotype-based design. Is there a sense that if we went to more studies like that, that um, we would get better buy-in from uh, the clinician colleagues? I mean, within our Ignite projects, I think that the design that we've had a fair bit of success with is sort of a pragmatic design um, where patients, either at a patient level and clinic level, we've done both, are randomized to a genotype guided versus not, and we give them the genotype at the, at the end. Um, and so I think it accomplishes several things. One, it allows the physician to develop, to develop a comfort level with having genotype and making clinical decisions. Um, and we haven't wrapped up, actually we're, we're closing um, our pain study hopefully in the next couple weeks. So we'll see how they turn out. But um, in, in terms of sort of getting physician buy-in and what we have found, um, and, I, and I think I completely agree with Dick, you know, one of our biggest lessons learned within Ignite is, is uh, find find the enthusiastic clinicians. Um, and so, for example, we, at the very beginning of our program, went to psychiatry. We asked if they would be interested in doing um, CYP2C19 2D6 guided um, antidepressant therapy. They're like, nah, that's okay, I don't think so. so. So we said, okay, we're plenty busy. Well, they have come back to us. We've now, um, I think, enrolled our last patient in a pragmatic trial in pediatric psych. And, and so um, there is this element of just sort of momentum um, and, and focusing on those where you have um, a, a local advocate, and you know, if you will, embedded in that clinical group uh, because it's so much more effective. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what the right answer. I think these, you know, this attempt at the perfect randomized controlled, you know, tightly regimented design is, is not the answer. Um, that's what COAG was, and I, I don't know that it helped us um, understand anything that's true to real life. Um, so, so thinking about, you know, can you, do, can you do pragmatic designs that still allow you to do data collection and answer real questions, but it also feels more natural and, and you can flow then easily into a clinical implementation. Mark. 
I wanted to come back to a point that I think it was Julie brought up earlier, because I, I, I think this is a, a critical piece. If we think about the evidence needed to implement something, um, uh, an evidence-based guideline, say, um, I think it's significantly different than if we look at something that's a patient safety issue. Um, and when we look at some of the, the significance of some of these adverse events or the implications of giving clopidogrel to somebody that's a poor metabolizer uh, and, and knowing what, what the data shows, you know, could patient safety approaches for those that really meet that threshold get us away from this evidence, you know, th there's never enough evidence to implement something. And I'd be interested if there are folks that have taken that approach and whether that, you know, changes the tenor of the conversation within the organization. Because I think we frankly have a pretty good case in, in many areas to make in the safety realm. Howard. So, Mark, I think you might already know this, but the, the name of our um, intervention panel is the Therapy Risk Mitigation Panel. It doesn't mention the word genome, doesn't work anything to do with DNA, it doesn't have analytics, doesn't have big data, but it has, it's, it's therapy, risk, mitigation, and it happens to be a panel. So, so that way people can focus on what we're trying to achieve as opposed to getting lost in a double helix. And, and I think it's really important because patient safety moves the needle. Um, other stuff is for tomorrow. Go ahead. And I can actually say that it was um, framing the personalized medicine program at Mission in the context of patient safety and patient-centered care that got the board of directors to approve having a program to begin with. Um, because, it, you know, although they asked you know, about cost and, and savings, it was the safety issue. So although that is the context within which we've developed this program, still within that context, there are various responses to quality. We even have our quality officer be our physician champion, um, but that's not enough for our P&T committee. There has to be, you know, several clinicians from each of the service lines to then you know, give testimonial on why this is clinically useful. So, you know, yes, so it works, but not all the time. Mayor. In my experience. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I agree it has a short-term uh, panache, but, you know, it depends on how serious the disease that you're treating is and what the alternative therapy is available for making that decision based on pharmacogenetics. So at the beginning, we got away with decreasing thiopurine doses in ALL based on TPMT status to prevent life-threatening toxicity. But very quickly, people said, well, how do you know you're not compromising the anti-leukemic effect? And without those data, we never would have got buy-in. I just had a conversation at the back of the room this morning with somebody about UGT1A1 and irinotecan, which clearly predisposes to toxicity from irinotecan, but it's not been widely adopted from the cancer community, partly because those patients have a chance of cure from that drug, and everyone's afraid that reducing the drug to reduce toxicity will be a problem, even if it's based on genotype. And let's not forget what the FDA has just done. The best way to avoid toxicity is to not use the drug. And so that's been the response of the FDA for codeine for all children less than 12 years of age. So I don't think we can only base our studies on preventing toxicity. Stephen, you have Yeah, and I certainly wasn't meaning that this is a panacea, but I think for certain select cases, and again, I think the advantage that most of you and most of us that have done this is that once you get a, a success or two under your belt where you can really, at your institution, implement it and show that it really does make a difference, then I think the and, and also do it in a way that doesn't uh, totally disrupt the physician's workflow, a very important consideration. In fact, maybe even makes your life better if we're really intelligent about it. Um, then I think the energy barrier to overcome for subsequent ones where you can use a different approach may be slightly lower. And, and particularly when you begin to potentially, you know, publish outcomes at the practitioner level, which many of us do across many different quality indicators, and notice that those people that use it have different outcomes than those that don't. Um, I think that is also something, it's that peer comparison that also can uh, make a difference. Steve. 
Well, I think my comments now are maybe not so uh, quite so relevant to where the uh, the discussion has gone, but uh, um, because we're finding that we need to um, generate some of the knowledge if we're going to implement this into into pediatrics, we've we've uh, taken a little bit of a we're taking a little bit of a different approach to it, and that is uh, rather than starting with the um, uh, the drug or the gene, we're trying to um, get our folks to think about um, what is the uh, response or the outcome that is uh, expected or desired from the, uh, the therapeutic intervention. And then working back and saying, well, what is the exposure or the concentration of the active form of what's being administered that needs to be present to have a pri high probability of achieving that response? And then you know, what dose needs to be administered to the individual patient to achieve that response. And uh, as if you work through that process, you start to find out what, what genes may or may not be uh, important, and then those are the ones that, you know, should be um, paired with the uh, administration, or with the uh, drug that's going to be administered to the, um, uh, to the outcome of interest. Uh, the challenge with that is that uh, if you're going to work backwards like that, you have to have a, a, a means of, 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 of uh, giving everybody the, the right exposure, or the same, the same exposure. You have to, for, the, for drugs that are subject to a polymorphically expressed clearance pathway, um, there's going to be a lot of variability in exposure. And so th I think this is one of, the, one of the barriers that we're going to have to deal with if we can get people to, uh, to buy into that approach. Um, the underlying question, now I'm taking away from my presentation tomorrow, but the underlying question is, is, is a failure to respond to the medication a function of an inadequate exposure, or is it a function of something that's inherently different at the level of the drug target? Because we don't go after genetic variation in the drug target very often. Um, it's hard to get at some of these things if, if your drug target's in the CNS, for example. So the depression, the autism, the ADHD, the things that affect a lot of the uh, patients that, uh, that our clinicians that have uh, drank the Kool-Aid, at least the flavor of the Kool-Aid that, Kool that we're serving up, uh, those are the things that they're that they're interested in. So one of the buckets that we've sort of gotten into a few times was the whole bucket of <clears throat> payer and reimbursement issues, and obviously some of that's going to be based on evidence gaps. But John, I'm going to look to you. I mean, so one of the things that we've talked a lot about today is the relative value of economics versus outcomes, especially outcomes that you know may save a uh, life. H how do you at Optum and how do payers in general, as a, putting you on the spot as a representative for them, uh, how do you think about that? So thank you for that. Um, I mean, the first thing they do is obviously look at the evidence base. They'll look at the clinical guidelines. They'll look at what the societies have produced. Um, they'll run the literature reviews. Um, and that will go through an assessment committee of some sort, and they make a decision. Um, and there's a variety of different criteria that are put into that mix. I think one of the things that's fascinating about this space, um, and I think actually warrants further discussion with members of, of this group, that's, that's different about this space is the persistency of the data. Um, and that means, I think, we... I think there is time, I think it would be time worth spent thinking about how is this field different to a regular lab test? How do, how do we think about this differently to a, to a cholesterol test? Um, I'm not saying I've got all the answers, uh, but what I would say is I think there's an appetite to listen. So if folks are interested around how should we think about the economics of this differently, I think that would be a discussion that there would be an appetite to have. So put simply, um, I think we want to listen to you folks. So I think we've, we've, it's been mentioned a couple of times, you know, th there's a lot of concern, I think, amongst people in the field that we all are subject to some level of genetic exceptionalism because it is maybe no, it is no different from a cholesterol level, especially if you have a cholesterol levels in a family, right? So you actually, so, but I think it is different. I think my, my, my purview is that there is, there is value. I mean, Mark said it earlier, and, I, and I, concur with, I concur with him. There is value. This data is persistent. You all, you all know that much better than I do. Um, 
that has implications for how you think about the space. So I think the lifetime value of some of these tests, I think that's a really interesting construct, which I don't think often gets described. So I'm, I'm interested in kind of pushing that space forward. Well, can you just help? How, how does that jive with the fact that we have so much impermanence in our insurance for any one individual switches from insurer to insurer to insurer? So what's, what's in it for the primary insurer, the, the current insurer, in paying for a lifelong test? Because they, they won't have that patient under their insurance policy, the 20 or 34. I mean, what, what do insurance people say about that? Use your microphone, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Better? Yeah, much better. I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> okay. Um, that is not an attempt to avoid the question, okay. but it is an attempt to give a different perspective on, on I think, where we're trying to go. Um, what fascinates me about the space is the cost of some of this testing is falling dramatically. Right? Well, I think everyone would agree the cost of some of this testing is falling dramatically. So these, these notions of what... Um, if it's a $250 test, I mean, that's, more, that's cheaper than an MRI, isn't it? You it's don't have to tell me. Quite a bit. <laughs> so I think what's interesting is, is, is the lifelong value discussion, is that a little bit of a red herring, given the cost of this thing has fallen so much? So there is persistency, there is value in that sense, because you don't want to get the patient retested. But there is also value in the fact that the costs alone have come down substantively. I think that, that is an interesting... So is that not well appreciated in your sector? Which bit? The low price. I think that, um, again, it comes back down, and I hate to beat a dead horse, and for folks that you probably hear me say this again, it comes down to the coding, mm -hmm. right? We see such variation in what test is being done, what's getting charged for. It is difficult to make an ascertain, to ascertain precisely for this test this cost has dropped. Because often the codes get, the, the, the tests get bundled together in a CPT code and it's difficult to tease that out. Um, so again, to, to beat the dead horse a little bit more, it comes back down to the coding. If we can get the accurate coding, then we can answer some of these questions more appropriately. So when you talk about persistence, so maybe I was misunderstanding how you're thinking about persistence. So most of us believe that at least for germline-related uh, issues, uh, you know, cancer, somatic cancer issues are a different story. But for germline issues, by persistence, do you mean the fact that once you've done the test once, you know what the answer is, right. whereas for cholesterol, maybe you need to do it multiple right. times That's in order I mean. to do it? Yep. So that should reduce the threshold for you to accept uh, evidence then. So it's, again, I'll say two things. I'm, this. This whole notion right now of persistency, this, this almost, um, almost if you would think about it as an asset, you capitalize the asset and you depreciate it. I mean, that's the way you think about it. Um, I think there is an entire thread of discussion around how do you actually measure and manage the health economics in this space different to other domains? In other words, do you need to look at this space with net new eyes? I think that is the discussion that folks um, inside our organization would be willing to have. I'm not saying they're going to agree with you all, but I will say that we're interested in having dialogue. So to be humble, we don't... You, the, the audience around this table, around this room, is probably the experts in the United States. From our perspective, we are dealing with multiple different issues. But I think what we'd like to do is engage, have a dialogue, and start thinking through how would some of this actually work. So I'm not saying we've got all the answers. What I am saying is we're happy to listen. So I think the persistence piece of it, just to dial in on that a little bit more, suggests that actually, you know, th this idea that some of us have actually championed that do a genome sequence at birth and have that sequence, do it once, and if it costs, pick a number, $1,500, $2,000, and you've prevented some percentage of people from getting a $3,000 BRCA test, yeah, obviously the economics of that would change over time. But, you know, so that's an argument for that persist persistence actually go straight to the juggler on that let, let me Let me push you on that, on that one. The other kind of function of this, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll beat the horse a little bit more, coding is one facet of it, quality is the other facet of it. How do you know, how do we know, 
how does an insurer know, a payer, whether it's United or another payer, that what they're paying for is actually good quality? Right? I'll say it again. How do you know that what you're paying for is good quality? And I would urge you all to, in the evidence generation space, as you think about this, to think about what is the evidence, what is the quality evidence here? Right? Mark? So, so I think there, there's a piece that's not been articulated here that's really important when it comes to the insurer, which is it's, it's a different issue if we do a test for an indication um, at a low cost, uh, because if you, if you say, uh, well, this, um, this person's coming in for a stent, uh, so we're going to do, um, we need to have the CYP2C19 status to see if we use clopidogrel or not. We could do that on a panel uh, at a cost of, say, $250, which for most payers would not even trigger their review because it's under, the, under a threshold. And so unless there's a, uh, you know, some sort of an exclusion on genetic testing in general, you might not even, you know, need to go through prior authorization or anything of that nature. You then have the information from all of the rest of that that you essentially can use for free from the payer perspective. Because you've got the information. You don't have to ask them, or would you be willing to pay for this, this, and this? But that's a very different issue than what we're proposing, which is to do preemptive testing absent an indication and then expecting a payer to pay for that because that is not the payer model. Um, payers pay on medical necessity. Uh, and we don't have a medical necessity argu argument for preemptive testing, which is why, you know, many of us are looking to other mechanisms to generate data that we can then use in that setting. Until, unless we can prove it's cheaper. Well, but no, actually not. You would be, for, for Medicare, for example, it doesn't matter how cheap it is because the legislation says we only pay for medically necessary tests. And almost all policies say we only pay for medically necessary tests. And there's never a situation where, non, where a non-indication-based test would be medically necessary. It's, it's, it's anathema. So, uh, so that's a fundamental issue that it's not a matter of the economics that answers the question about why, why would a payer pay for a test without an indication? What about a medical checkup? They, they, cover, they cover a lot of medical checkups. So there are preventive services, mm -hmm. which right. Medicare doesn't cover. By the way, that's an exclusion. Uh, any preventive services covered by Medicare was either legislatively approved or through the ACA uh, has a, uh, meets the USPSDF task force recommendations. or in the HMO model where you have a wellness benefit. But it's defined in the benefit. Uh, so there, there could be a situation, you could imagine a payer saying, we are convinced enough that we are going to include preemptive pharmacogenomic testing as part of our benefit package that you pay for. Uh, and, and, and so that would be a potential model for coverage. But you know, approaching them uh, you know, outside of that type of a discussion would, would not really be fruitful. There's another, go ahead. So Mark, could we push that just a little bit further? Because, because the fact of the matter is, as a result of work by a lot of people in this room, what 30 years ago, before half the people in this room were born, some of us, TPMT looked really exciting and it was to totally new and it wasn't anything that, that, uh, that we had much precedent for. Now we have a whole panel where for individual drugs, the evidence is, is pretty strong. So what we're really talking about, I, I find myself, and it won't sh surprise those of you who know me, saying that really pharmacogenomics is clinical genomics for every patient everywhere. Now, I sincerely believe that. It wasn't 30 years ago, it is today. What's the difference between this, since all of us, I've heard rumors, are going to get older, with the exception of me, of course, uh, all of us are going to get older, and as we get older, we're going to be exposed to some of these drugs, not all of them, but to some of them, and that's why I say it's for everybody everywhere. This is beginning to approach the situation that we see with vaccination. I heard what you said about prevention, but as a matter of fact, this is a little unusual, even for genomic medicine. And it may be a societal good to have this information in your electronic health record. Actually, I want it mine. Uh, I am beginning to approach those ages. So, so, so uh, you know, I, I, just because Medicare doesn't cover prevention, society's decided prevention's pretty important. 
uh, and uh, this is a little different than the way we usually talk about this. And I see John over here fainting dead away. <laughs> but but, but as, a, as a matter of fact, uh, I think that there is some comparability to vaccination now. It wasn't 30 years ago, but it is now. Now, that's the strangest thing anyone said in this room today, but that's all right. That's why you have me. That's why I invent, invite you. Well, again, you, yes. I think you can. Yeah, let, let, let's let. So, so I, I think, I mean, the point that you're making is a perfectly reasonable one, but the, the case that you need to make for society to say everybody's in, like we've done for vaccination, is a very different evidentiary case than it is to say, I'm going to do a panel because I have an indication to, to do a pharmacological I know that. I just made, test. I just said what I thought. <laughs> right, right. So, but, but we're seeing in the payer world, uh, particularly in cancer genetics, that they're comfortable moving from the model of BRCA1 and 2 testing to say, you know what, we know that the phenotype is not as clear cut as it, as it is. And so we're willing to pay for panels, you know, that meet our family history criteria or and, whatever. And I work with cancer too, and I've seen that, yeah, that model. Right, so, so that's a model that actually, if you want to talk about something that could be implemented in the short term, is probably very pragmatic. Go ahead. I just, um, when we were talking about the lifelong, the persistence of these <clears throat> things that we make sure that we're careful not to promise that uh, once we test, do the 2D6 genotyping test, we will never need to do that again because uh, in, with the exception of if we were 100% coverage on a whole genome sequence, which to my knowledge there aren't anybody that can do that yet, um, uh, that the variants we're testing now you know, if two years from now there's another one that comes that's, you know, 20 KB away, that's in the middle of some enhancer thing, that's really the thing that really could contribute as much to some of these, uh, you know, the genetic variation as, uh, as any of the other ones, um, except the knockout ones. We just got to be careful that we're not promising that we will never uh, do this again as the technology is advancing, even, you know, PGR and seq that doesn't cover the, that covers the main gene, but there's still other places, and maybe the algorithms for aligning it are a little bit different or something, so that would be the only comment there. Okay, well then maybe um, that we can move to a, another one of the sort of buckets that I think uh, we've heard about today. Um, and I'll, I'll lump sort of two buckets together. Um, the one bucket was the idea of data infrastructure. Do we have the right data infrastructure to support uh, robust uh, pharmacogenomics going forward. And I think there are a couple of issues. Uh, one, we heard a lot of discussion about nomenclature. We don't even have a good nomenclature for uh, pharmacogenomics and for phenotypes. And how do we go about fixing that? And then a related sort of data infrastructure issue, um, which uh, Heidi was passionate about, is how do we make, what can we do? And it, I think, also relates to the quality issue that you raised. You know, can't we just agree that? Everybody has to sort of deposit their data somewhere as a consequence of ability to get paid and use that as a way to measure uh, quality and begin to assess quality. I, I think there's nothing magical about, you know, most of these genomic tests. There are quality measures that are built into them that one can provide. So there's the issue of data infrastructure, so I want to hear people's thoughts about that. But obviously related to data infrastructure is how do you store and present that data you know, and Sandy talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of the I IT infrastructure. And again, I think the IT infrastructure is important in terms of, A, how do you provide downstream, downstream to non-experts the ability to use that data in an effective way? And then there's a second issue of, if we do a lot of this preemptively, how do we make sure the data is stored and broadly available to everybody? And this is Roden's idea of you carry it around on a chip in your wallet. Maybe that's not the best way. Maybe someplace in the cloud is better. <laughs> but um, so comments about sort of those two issues, the idea of uh, IT. And obviously, your idea of persistence also relates to the value of uh, data infrastructure and, and IT infrastructure. So John. So, so let me push on the, I, I love that term data infrastructure. I think you've crystallized that really nicely. Um, and it's kind of fascinating to me to see um, this space mature, and I would, again, I'll, I'll beat the horse a little bit more. I would strongly suggest that this is one of the biggest limiting factors to this approach getting adopted more widestream. Because if we can't understand what we are talking about, then we will never make decisions around reimbursement or quality 
or appropriateness or choose your favorite use case. So I would strongly urge the powers that be, whoever they, whoever they may be, to focus on this area because I think it will be an accelerant um, in an appropriate way to ensure appropriateness of utilization. I welcome your feedback as well. I think it's important to, to think through this space at different levels. I think there's a nomenclature piece around this. Now, how, are we all talking the same thing? Right? I, I don't know if we are. Um, I think there's confusion. It's a bit like British English and American English. I think we're, we're talking past each other sometimes. Um, so I think there's a nomenclature piece. And then I think there's a real practicalities piece. How do we, how do we move the data around? Um, what do we need to do to analyze the data? Is the bioinformatics pipeline stable? Do we know what version control looks like? So there's, there's two threads of dialogue. That would be my immediate reaction to that. But I would say in closing, um, I would be very happy to work with folks if, as part of that journey. We would be highly engaged in that, in that process if um, other people around this table would be so interested. Mark. So the, nom the nomenclature piece, I think, is close to being a resolved issue. And I think the, the pieces that are needed to bring that to closure are in place. And so I don't see that as being a gap that needs additional effort to fill. I think the work that CPIC is doing um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to bring uh, phenotypic terms together and that, we're, we're pretty close. There are a few edge cases that need to be solved, but uh, I, I see the, the, uh, the end of that pretty quickly. The others are um, more problematic, but I think the, the, one of the rate limiting steps for representation of the data in a structured form in the electronic health record environment is that barrier is being lowered because there are more and more end user demands to say we need to have this data in there, and there's more and more um, uh, experience at the vendor level where their customers are saying, we need to have the ability to have access to this data in a structured format, and we need to have your decision support support these types of things. So I see that as moving along fairly substantially, although there's still much more to do. I think the biggest gap that I would see is the portability of the data with the patient. And that, I think, is a fascinating area uh, that would be very um, amenable to uh, some research. Sandy. If I could make two points, and the, the first one's a little out there, so I'm going to put that first, and then, and then the second one will be more concrete. So within, within this meeting, we've talked about clinical decision support of the form where you have a defined rule that you implement, it executes, it generates an alert, it doesn't generate an alert, type of clinical decision support. There has been a dream that's been out there for at least 10 years that I, to best of my knowledge, has not been realized yet, but with deep learning, machine learning techniques, there's, there's, there's increasing hope of it, that be able to generate another kind of clinical decision support that would work by generating indexes of similarity to, from, from your patient to other patients that have been previously seen in the electronic health record select out patients that are similar to the patient that you're seeing, and then use that to generate statistics about what you are likely to see in this patient. Which, if that was done, there's a whole bunch of challenges. By the way, in pharmacogenomics, one of the interesting things that it makes easy relative to that is one, one of the biggest challenges there is lining up past pa patients in terms of time for determining, you know, what what point in their life is equivalent to the point in your patient's life now, whereas in pharmacogenomics you're going to, describe, you're going to prescribe a drug. So that piece gets easy, easier. But it's challenging. But if, if this was done, then that starts to address, I think, some of the evidence things that we're looking at, et cetera. So just something that I wanted to throw out there. You know, by the way, Amazon does that every day, so. Yeah. it's. It, it, I mean, in general, within health IT, the, 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 the fraction of what we do in the health space relative to what everybody else does everywhere is, is, is incredible. Um, the, um, so, so something just a little more specific. So on the coding issue, so one of the things that I do wonder, one, one of the things that I think still, as, as Mark points out, we're making good progress on this, but, but something that's still out there is, or multiple things that are still out there, but um, 
tests and really defining the tests. And what I'm wondering, I just don't know the answer to this in terms of what insurance companies provide. What you're saying you need from an insurance perspective is pretty much the exact same thing that these rule-based clinical decision support algorithms need. They need a very well-defined, you know, what test was run, as well as for the clinical decision support, what the answer was. Um, do you get LOINC codes or SNOMED codes in, you know, in the di when, when you receive claims? Um, well, that's, well, just hold on a second there. So inside Optum, when we pull the data out of the EMR, by definition, we will get the LOINC code and the SNOMED code, where we're doing the chart extract. Right now I'm wearing the Optum hat. If I look at a... Um, an 837 or a, a claims form, if you will. The, the criteria, the metrics that are typically on those are CPT codes um, and IC9 slash IC10 codes these days. Um, there are additional fields that you can leverage inside those claims forms for additional information. Uh, and I think that's what's interesting about this domain. We may not, I think SNOMED is limited in its own right. I think there's too many different reference labs doing too many different tests um, that make it amenable to a SNOMED solution. Um, but your challenge, the challenge that you're facing in clinical decision support in the EMR is a very, very similar use case to the challenge a payer is making about whether to pay this claim or not, right? So the, the base predicates of what's the data element how do I build a declarative logic off the back of it to drive some kind of decision? You can take that path and you can apply it to a payer. Hence, my belief is we've got to get some kind of coding going, or it's a reference piece um, that facilitates this both on the payer side of the house and also on the provider side of the house. Uh, and again, my lens on this isn't just UHC being the payer, it's also Optum with our own physician groups. That makes sense? Yeah, and it feels like the LOINC codes and the CPT codes, that they should be aligned. Well, I mean, let me be clear. I, my personal view, and I, and I really would welcome further dialogue in this, is that CPT codes are not sufficient and do not meet the use case need in this space for testing. I personally believe that it's not sufficient because the rate of change in this field is so fast and the time to get a CPT code so, so long, there's always going to be a mismatch. There needs to be a, a much, I think you folks call it GT, GTR, is that what you all? The 5,000, you have a database of 5,000 audible tests. Well, we know there's 65,000 tests in the market. So the, instantly there's a mismatch there, right? So this, this issue is, in my opinion, is something that's inhibiting um, decision support in the EMR what payers are paying for, how do we measure quality, um, to right down to the comments earlier around consumers and how do we know what's the right test mm -hmm. for a consumer. It's got manifestations everywhere. I, again, I welcome discussion on that. But, uh, Marilyn, did you? <coughs> so my comment was actually on your first point, the, the way out there one. Um, so I have come across two pieces of commercial software that will do that. Theoretically, you know, they advertise, no, they're not advertised, one is advertised for healthcare, the other one is advertised just for big data. Um, the one is a half a million dollars per user ID on, it's a cloud-based system. The other one is a half a million dollars for two user IDs on a cloud-based system. Um, so I think that realization is coming I know of about five or six research labs in the U.S. that are trying to develop those algorithms. And my, so I have a Pennsylvania State Department of Health grant where one of the aims is to work on that, um, trying to come up with a strategy that's not half a million dollars. You know, a lot of health systems can't afford such a thing, certainly for one person to run it. Um, so I think we are moving towards that realization, just not as fast as I think we would all like. Okay, so I think we're running the end of our time. I hate to say this, but Mark, you might have the last word. Oh, God. <laughs> and, and I'm going to dive into code. So this is really <laughs> horrific. So everybody's going to be definitely ready for a drink after this. I just wanted to, to make sure that um, 
uh, we, we weren't going in a direction, because what I heard in your comments, Sandy, was that, you know, there is a one solution, you know, one code to rule them all. And I really don't think that that's going to be the case. I think that the LOINC code, while very specific, if you can imagine I have to fire a decision support rule for SIP 2C19, I could get that from a single test, I could get it from a panel, uh, I could get it from an exome, but the LOINC code that I would need to run the CDS is specific, but it doesn't help the payer to know where that was derived from. And so there's not a one-to-one -one match between those things. What we're really talking about here is a system that as yet doesn't exist. And the problem that you referenced between GTR and what you know is that GTR is completely volunteer. Uh, and there's, and, and unless you have something that ties to the payment, um, then it becomes very problematic. And as, as you well know, the, the additional fields were used for a period of time when CPT went down the really bizarre direction, let's just do it on procedures, which was extremely helpful for everybody, was that they said, well, you could enter, I think it was a G code or something that, that would give a name of a test, like BRC, so you at least knew what was happening. But again, it was voluntary. And it, was, and it wasn't used. And so the, the question is how, this is a really diverse set of stakeholders and how to get them in, in a room together and to agree that this is the problem and that we need a solution that actually would work in all the different scenarios I think is, is an extremely challenging one but is a very high priority. So, so we, we'd be, sorry, I'd be very happy to host that meeting. So if we can get the right people in the room I'd be happy to host that. We've got to figure that one out because it's it's slowing down this uh, field. Yeah, I, I mean, earlier you talked about the powers that be. The problem is the powers that be. This is so far from what they think about on a daily basis okay. that I think we're suffering from that. So I I, I think this was I, I was a little worried about how much ro how robust the discussion was going to be because we had already had a lot of discussion today. But this was fantastic. I, I just want to close before we thank everybody for participating. It was just sort of a quick little survey I'm curious about. So I want a show of hands. How many people today here think we're ready for clinical Im implementation of pharmacogenomics today? Wow, almost everybody. How many people don't? <laughs> All right, well, on that happy note. <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody on the panel and everybody in the audience for all of their participation. So.